I've pointed out in numerous videos that jihad proceeds in stages. When Muhammad and his followers were only a tiny minority of the population, they were commanded to preach a message of peace and tolerance. When Muhammad had gained a larger following and had formed alliances with various tribes, but wasn't yet strong enough to subjugate non-Muslims, he was ordered to wage defensive jihad. The Muslim community would fight unbelievers, but only if the unbelievers did something first. When Muhammad and his followers became the most powerful force in Arabia, they were commanded to wage offensive jihad, violently subjugating non-Muslims simply for being non-Muslims. So the hostility of the Muslim community towards unbelievers was directly proportional to the military strength of the Muslim community. The Muslim population in France is somewhat higher than the Muslim population in most other European countries, and the numbers have risen very sharply in recent years, so we shouldn't be surprised to see an increase in terrorist attacks. What we might find surprising is that many of the terrorists, before turning to jihad, spent years living very un-Islamic lifestyles. They were what we might call bad Muslims. Why would bad Muslims care enough about Islam to wage jihad? Muhammad Lahwe Bulel, for instance, who killed 84 people in Nice, reportedly drank alcohol, ate pork, took various drugs, went salsa dancing, had a pretty wild sex life, didn't fast during Ramadan, and didn't go to the mosque. He only recently began taking his Islamic faith more seriously. But once he began taking Islam seriously, he crashed a truck into a crowd of men, women, and children and shouted Allahu Akbar during his shootout with police. We see this pattern over and over again among jihadis. Young Muslims go clubbing, go drinking, and then suddenly go on a killing spree shouting Allahu Akbar. And the friends and relatives of the jihadis then point to their past behavior as proof that they didn't really care about Islam, so they must have decided to slaughter unbelievers in the name of Allah for some other reason. I wish that politicians and reporters and people in general would make some sort of informed effort to understand why so many Muslims who spent years engaged in very un-Islamic behavior end up waging terrorist attacks. Because anyone who really wants to know why young Muslims can rapidly transform from party animals to suicide bombers will quickly learn that France has produced a recipe for endless terrorist attacks. But since it's unreasonable to expect politicians and the media to do any actual thinking, we'll once again have to do the difficult work for them. Let's go through France's recipe for endless jihad. And to help our leaders and reporters, I'll once again make this so shockingly simple a four-year-old can understand it. First, many young Muslims, like many young Christians and many young Jews, live double lives. Muslims are raised to believe that Islam is true, that the Quran is the perfect word of Allah, and that Muhammad is a wonderful pattern of conduct. But they grow up in France, where they're free to do just about anything they want. So they do the kinds of things that many high school students and college students do. They drink, they do drugs, they have sex. In most Muslim countries, they wouldn't have the same easy access to alcohol and so on. But in France, they can do what they want. But here's the key. They still believe that Islam is true. They know that they're not living according to the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith, but they believe that they're supposed to live according to the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith. So they're Muslims in terms of what they believe, but they're not Muslims in terms of their actions. And again, plenty of Christians and Jews can relate to this. There are lots of people from different religious traditions who aren't living according to the standards of those traditions, but who still believe in the traditions. This is what I mean when I say that many young Muslims live double lives, believing one thing, but doing another. Second, the Islamic beliefs of these Muslims are almost never seriously challenged. They're told all their lives by their leaders and their families that Muhammad was the greatest man who ever lived, that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad, that the Quran is filled with miraculous scientific insights, and so on. Now, these beliefs are complete nonsense, but no one bothers to show the Muslim that these beliefs are complete nonsense. In fact, quite the opposite. Politicians and the media go out of their way to block criticism of Muhammad and the Quran. People who dare to tell Muslims the truth about Islam are called racists and bigots and hate mongers and Islamophobes. And this makes it very easy for the Muslim to dismiss any criticisms of Islam. Oh, they're just criticizing my beliefs because they're racists, not because there's any real problem with my beliefs. So the Muslim goes through life convinced that Islam is indisputably true and this conviction is never seriously challenged. Third, some of these Muslims eventually decide to be good Muslims instead of bad Muslims. Since they've gone through life believing one thing but doing another, 
they've had the same kind of internal struggle a Christian or a Jew might go through, the same kind of internal struggle someone who smokes might go through if he believes that smoking is bad but continues to smoke anyway. And the Muslim, either because he's matured or because he's been confronted by some more devout Muslims, decides to become more consistent. He decides to actually do what Allah and Muhammad command him to do. So he stops drinking. He stops clubbing. He strives to be a good Muslim so that he can be accepted by Allah. Fourth, some of the Muslims who begin striving to be better Muslims so that they can be accepted by Allah come to realize that they can't really know if they've been good enough to be accepted by Allah. You can find statements in the Muslim sources that tell you what good Muslims are supposed to do if they want to enter paradise. But as a Muslim, you just don't know you're standing with Allah. The worst sin in Islam is shirk, associating something with Allah, idolatry. How do you know whether you're idol free enough for Allah? Do you love money too much? Do you love your house more than you should? You don't know. So you have no assurance of salvation. And here's where things get scary. Even the best Muslims don't know what Allah is going to do with them on Judgment Day. Even Muhammad himself didn't know what Allah was going to do with him. In Surah 46, verses 8 to 9, we read, Or do they say, he, Muhammad, has fabricated it? Say, if I have fabricated it, still you have no power to support me against Allah. He knows best of what you say among yourselves concerning it, i.e. this Quran. Sufficient is he as a witness between me and you and he is the oft-forgiving, the most merciful. Say, O Muhammad, I am not a new thing among the messengers of Allah, i.e. I am not the first messenger, nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. I only follow that which is revealed to me, and I am but a plain warner. Muhammad is commanded in the Quran to say that he doesn't know what Allah is going to do to him. And the verse is referring to salvation. We know this because when Muhammad actually says what Allah tells him to say, it's in the context of salvation. Let's look at a passage. In Sahih al-Bukhari 3929, a devout Muslim named Uthman dies, not the Caliph Uthman, a different Uthman, and a Muslim woman says to the body, I bear witness that Allah has honored you. Muhammad replies, how do you know that Allah has honored him? The woman is shocked that someone this devout has no assurance of salvation, so she asks, who else is worthy of it, if not Uthman? And Muhammad's response is terrifying for Muslims. He answers, As to him, by Allah, death has overtaken him, and I hope the best for him. By Allah, though I am the messenger of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do to me. This is Muhammad, the greatest Muslim in history, saying, You want me to tell you what Allah is going to do with this guy? I'm Allah's prophet, and I don't even know what he's going to do with me. Muhammad's closest companion, Abu Bakr, the first of the rightly guided caliphs, said, If I had one foot in paradise, I would still fear Allah's deception. Now, if the best Muslims didn't know what Allah was going to do to them, what hope is there for bad Muslims? If Abu Bakr didn't feel safe, and you've spent half your life drinking and gambling and partying and fornicating, how can you possibly feel safe? You can't. Fifth, there is one way to feel safe and know that you'll be accepted by Allah. You already know what it is, don't you? If you know it, how difficult do you think it is for the conflicted Muslim to figure out? If he doesn't know, trust me, the online recruiter will tell him. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2787, Muhammad declares, Allah guarantees, notice, now you have a guarantee from Allah himself, that he will admit the mujahid, the jihadi, someone who wages jihad, in his cause, into paradise, if he is killed. Otherwise, he will return him to his home safely with rewards and war booty. If you get killed while waging jihad, Allah guarantees you'll go to paradise. So even if you've spent years violating basic Islamic teachings, Allah makes you an offer. Die while killing unbelievers, and your salvation is assured. Putting all of this together, think about it this way. Suppose this circle represents the total Muslim population of France, several million Muslims. Many of these Muslims will be secular. Let's say that this circle represents the Muslims who aren't secular and whose heads are filled with silly claims that supposedly prove that Islam is true. Some of these Muslims will be very devout and will do what Muslims are supposed to do, but many others will end up doing things that are forbidden in Islam, even though they sincerely believe that it's true. This circle represents the bad Muslims. 
Of the bad Muslims, some are going to continue being bad Muslims all their lives, while others are going to decide to become good Muslims at some point. In this circle are the bad Muslims who decide to become good Muslims. Many of the Muslims who try to turn their lives around will be perfectly satisfied saying their daily prayers, giving alms, taking the pilgrimage to Mecca, and so on. They'll think that they're okay with Allah because they're doing what Muslims are supposed to do. Others will be scared and distressed. They understand that because they've done so many bad deeds, they can never be sure that their good deeds will outweigh their bad deeds. They'll have constant anxiety about their eternal destiny. They're in this circle. Some of these Muslims will press on and continue to live as Muslims, even though they're terrified about what might happen on Judgment Day. They'll just try their hardest and hope for the best. But some of these frightened Muslims won't want to spend their lives in a state of constant anxiety and uncertainty and to gamble with their salvation. They'd rather accept Allah's guarantee of a one-way ticket to paradise for anyone who dies while waging jihad. These are the people who are killing you, France. Oddly enough, when these young jihadis go on a killing spree, people read about their shady pasts and say, this attack can't have anything to do with Islam because this was a bad Muslim. Being a bad Muslim is what compelled him to accept Allah's offer of salvation in exchange for martyrdom. Islam was the driving force behind the attack. So the process that produces these attacks is straightforward. But now we have to ask, what are French leaders doing to change anything about this process? Absolutely nothing. And that's why the attacks in Paris and Nice are only the beginning.